Everybody, this is Perch. I think I've asked her this question before, but it's come up a lot lately. I got three people who asked me kind of all the same thing last week, and I think it's because of uh, some of the discussion on sales and numbers and history, uh, probably because of that Rob Liefeld, uh, Dan Slot thread. Uh, but the question is basically, why did the comic publishers walk away from the newsstand? And the answer is, is relatively simple. Uh, money. Money is the reason. Uh, money and, and security. So to understand this at kind of a basic layman's uh, point of view, and, and some people like they always do, and I appreciate it, by the way. I'm not saying that sarcastically. Uh, somebody in the comments will come and give a much more detailed explanation of some of the ins and outs and some of the nuances. But let me start simple. Because in many cases, just getting a simple understanding, as long as you realize there's more, there's, there's more to it than that, but just getting a high-level understanding helps a lot. Um, why the publishers walked away from the newsstand is because the, the newsstand was problematic for them. And what I mean by problematic is that there was returnability. And, and there was this concept of having to negotiate over uh, very large distribution channels. Uh, the second one is one that's not talked about as much. But the first one's talked about plenty. Basically, uh, a chain uh, like Kroger uh, orders uh, 100,000 copies of Amazing Spider-Man. And, the, and, and basically, they get a very thin margin on that comic. Uh, if it's a $1 comic, for example, the, uh, you know, the, the shop, the, the Safeway, Kroger, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up my story, the Kroger entity might pay, say, 85 cents. I think it was a little bit more generous than that, but not by much. They would pay like 85 cents per copy, and they could sell them for a dollar. Cover price, MSRP. And it, it wasn't a, a high profit item, but comics were seen as a commodity, particularly within convenience stores, grocery stores, gas stations, those types of places. People expected comics to be there because they had always been there since the 20s. And it was just one of those things you stop. But it was a headache because in order to have that deal, that gross distribution, um, and, and it was very, it was, a, it was a good thing for comics. They got their books out into a bunch of different places. Uh, they had to offer returnability. And returnability basically meant at the end of a period of time, um, four to six weeks. The, uh, they, again, there's lots of details to this that you should go look up if you're really curious about the ins and outs, the mechanics, the process, and all this stuff. But basically, the, uh, the Kroger in their individual stores, uh, once a week or once a month or whenever they got around to it, there were rules behind it. Um, they would rip the cover off of the comic, basically making it unsellable. This is how you do not get, uh, you know, th th there basically had to be proof that the comic didn't sell, but they also didn't want to absorb all of the shipping costs and other things. The comic was declared not resellable. Uh, because of the terms of the agreement. And generally, after staying four to six weeks on a wire newsstand, the comic was damaged anyway. So it, it's not like it could have survived coming back to uh, the publisher and then sold through a different channel. So what they would do is they would tear the cover off, they would send the cover back, and then they would get a, you know, a basically a, a refund, a rebate uh, for the returned comics that didn't sell. And then the you know the, the grocery store would take the comic, the rest of the comic, the comic without the cover, and it, they would take it to the back and throw it in the garbage. And then you know kids would learn when that was happening, and they would go into the garbage and grab the comics. And that's why if you ever go to a uh, like a flea market or a yard sale or something, you'll find all these comics without covers. And you're like, what's going on? Well, somebody swiped them from you know from the store. Um, the that that was not great for the publishers because basically they'd sell say a hundred thousand copies of Spider-Man to Kroger, uh, but and then they had to kind of wait in limbo to know how much they had to give back. So they they made some money, and then they would have to rebate or refund the Kroger for say sixty thousand returns. You know, and that was how the comic business worked. So when people talk about the newsstand, by the way, selling hundreds of thousands of copies, you know, you got to count in returnability because a lot of the comics, sometimes anywhere from 20 to 80 percent of the comics were returned. And that was one of the things Jim Shooter was particularly good at uh, at the time was really making it a machine that, uh, you know, discouraged it. Basically, he, he was able to kind of align the all the factors he could control to minimize the returns.
Um, and he did. Those, some of those are shipping on time, which uh, th there's a bunch of other little details in here. Regardless, um, the direct market offered a better deal seemingly for everyone. So remember the price. The Kroger is paying 85 cents. They're selling for a dollar. The direct market comes along and says, okay, here's what we'll do. We think we know how many comics will sell, sell out. So what we'll do is we'll buy the comic outright, forego returnability, meaning, you know, we can't return. If you don't sell it, we're stuck with it. But we want to pay 60 cents instead of 85. And so our profit instead of 15 cents would be 40 cents per copy. And uh, everybody liked this deal. So to, you know, to Marvel or to DC, to the publishers, they said, okay, we don't have to put out with any of the headache of, you know, accounting, of getting these comics back, of keeping a floating balance so we could, you know, refund things. It's, uh, you, you, it, it makes the sale one way and then it's over. And that was a huge, that was, that was going to be much better for everyone. The direct market liked it because they said, you know, we think we know comics and comics is growing as a business. So we'll be able to take a higher margin and we'll take the risk that we'll, uh, we know what's going on. And by and large, it worked for a period of time. There was a, a boom to the direct market in the early 90s. It's well publicized and comic shops uh, were good at it. And then there were other things like thrown into the pot, like uh, comic shops could get the, the comics a little earlier on better paper stock. There's a, there's a number of things that floated in there. And uh, it, it was successful. Uh, comic fans who are really hardcore collectors quickly learned that comics were probably handled in better shape at the comic shop. Because remember, when you're in a grocery store, the same guy who's putting the milk in the, you know, in the free, in the, the, the coolers is also throwing the comics on the racks. That's why a lot of comics at the grocery store, the newsstand were, you know, mildly destroyed because nobody cared. I remember being in a grocery store and somebody's like bringing out the new comics and I'm excited. And I watched the guy. He's holding it. He's got one of those little plastic straps holding a bundle of comics. He's holding it by the strap. So the comics are getting just wrecked along the side because the, the plastic strap's digging into the side of it. And then he gets close, you know, he gets to where I was at the stand and he takes this little like blade cutter out and he's still holding the comic over the ground, chops the thing and the comics just spill out onto the ground. And, you know, then he kind of, it's like, I'm staying there like, this guy's fucking up all the comics. Anyway, um, so it, it, overall, it seemed better for everyone. It seemed better for collectors. They got the comics earlier in better shape, better paper, better for the direct market because they were making more of a profit as long as they you know, estimated correctly, and better for the publishers because they didn't have to worry about any returnability. And yeah, they made less profit, but they also knew that once they took that profit, they were done. They could put it in the bank. They wouldn't have to worry about anything coming back. And it was just a, they could align their printing processes around it. And, and it was great. And then, of course, the publishers, as publishers do, started to think, you know, since we have this one-way market and we're a little closer to it, we can start doing variant covers and bag crap, and and we can really kind of, you know, really kind of insert new products into this market that's closer to us. And uh, that, you know, the, and then many other things happened, and then the late 90s and the bust happened, and you know, that's where, that's where we got where we got. But anyway, that's the relatively short answer of why did the publishers walk away from the newsstand? Um, the one thing that the publishers either didn't care about or didn't think about or whatever might have been was understand what getting away from the newsstand would mean for, you know, the, the growing market of comics, basically people coming in to comics. Because comics quickly... I put it, put it this way. I think that the publishers kind of always assumed there'd be some content going to grocery stores and the retail market, and they um, neglected to kind of take into account what would happen with retail, which is, you know, that that would start to, to f fall fast. You know, gas stations would start to do the pay at the pump, and so people weren't going into the convenience store anymore. And the direct market, while popular, was not doing a good job of bringing new customers into the mix. And so the audience just slowly started to shrink. And that's kind of where we are. That's where we've, where we've been. Today, it's an interesting factor. Uh, people you know, make this claim, you know, the, the loss of the, of the newsstand is what has killed comics. It's been slowly dying for 30 years. It's a bit of an extreme take, but it's not altogether wrong. Uh, the challenge is that the new market of comics, again, as we've talked about, it's being grown by other people. So the comic publishers find themselves in a position where, you know, they, they desire a new audience. They do not know how to get to the retail locations where that audience lives. 
and the comics are just slowly bleeding out. Um, and others are, others are now picking up the charge. Like, you know, like I mentioned, they've got, hell, you got manga in grocery stores now. And that's just that we're seeing kind of history repeat itself to some extent where this new market is going to be cultivated via the mass market. And, um, you know, bad news. Uh, well, I mean, bad news for, for somebody anyway. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Like I said, there's a lot of details. So I skimmed over some pretty important details. So please don't walk away from this going, I'm now an expert on what happened with publishing and comics. You, there's a lot more to do. And the place you want to go, certainly you can you can Google a lot of different things. There's good uh, material. I think Jim Zub has uh, referenced some of this before. Uh, the guys over at uh, John Jackson Miller Comicron have some, have some columns about this. There's lots of really good, I mean, hell, I'll, I'll even give a throw out. Brian Hibbs has done good uh, analysis of this. How about that? It's a crazy day. I'm, I'm complimenting Brian Hibbs. I joke. But there there you go. There's a bunch of good sources. And if you're interested, if this, this excites you, take it upon yourself to go check those other sources out, learn a little bit more. It's a fascinating story. And it really is one of those cases where uh, everybody believed they had a better deal until they didn't. Uh, such is the way of life. Anyway, uh, let me know your questions below. Keep sending in those questions. I love them like and subscribe, and thanks for listening.